Well, I'm here right now with one of the most successful and powerful CEOs here in the entire state of Utah, Rich Wood with New Skin. So it's a pleasure to be here in your office. Thank you, Rich. Oh, thank you. Happy to do it. It's uh, It's been fun as a kid. You know, I think I heard of New Skin since I was born. I swear it seems like they've been around longer than any other company here in the Valley. And you guys have grown now into a pretty much around a $4 billion company. And you're just a little farm boy from Idaho here running this huge company, but it's such a great story. And I want to get into that, but I wanted to ask you first, you're a big fan of pizza. You have your own pizza oven at your house. So if I'm looking to get the best pizza in the world, where do I want to go? To Italy. Actually, you go to Italy. <laughs> is it random enough, I guess. <laughs> That's right? actually where it started for me. So I, I ended up serving a mission in Italy and uh, really fell in love with Italian pizza. And someday I thought, boy, wouldn't it be cool if we had our own pizza oven so we could make the thin crust uh, pizza cooked at 700 degrees. When we built our home, we decided to, to and it's really funny the way it happened, I got to tell you. It was the sort of first thing that dropped in once they got the foundation in place. They had to crane in this pizza oven and everything else sort of built up around the pizza oven. So it really is sort of the centerpiece of our house down in the basement. Oh, what a cool little item to have in your house makes it unique over any other house I think I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. Um, well, and so growing up in Idaho, I mean, you grew up on a farm, you just a little tiny town. What's the name of the city you're from? Weezer. Weezer, we Idaho. See, I've never even heard of it. That's uh, I guess where in the, where's that located at? It's a little North of Boise and it's pretty common that people haven't heard of it. <laughs> okay. And what's life like growing up on a farm? Really, um, give us a vision of what your childhood will look like. Cause I know how hard people work when they grow up on farms. You've talked a lot about that hard work and, but what did life look like growing up on a farm? I was born actually in Utah, and then when I was six years old, we moved to Idaho. We lived in Boise for two years, and when I was eight, we moved on to this little dairy farm <clears throat> that my my dad bought. And there were three; the three oldest children were boys, and he wanted to, you know, have a place where we could work together, and, and that, that's what we did. I mean, we worked all the time, but he allowed us to have certain interests that he would prioritize for us. So we were really sports uh, addicts. We loved to play sports. Baseball and basketball particularly, and football uh, was not, not quite as much, but there. And so f work sort of took on everything in our life mm. with the exception of church and sports. And those things would stop and would do what needed to be done. But as soon as it was done, you were back out there working <laughs> to try and get things done. So it was uh, seven days a week. Mm. Would scale as much as we could back on Sunday, but the cows still had it to be milked and fed. And other than that, and, and we did it all together. It wasn't, uh, you know, mm. one or two per no. We were all in and uh, just really gave us a chance, I think, to bond as a family and learn what it's like to work hard. Well, I think the principles that you learn, I mean, you're waking up at what time to get up and milk cows every morning? Yeah, four or five o'clock. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, and it's not warm. A lot of people there. don't know there's <laughs> another four on the clock. <laughs> yeah, I, I think some of the most of the hardest working guys I've ever met or women as well have come from that farm background. There's just such a beauty to really working that hard towards something. I think it instills in you in those principles. And you've talked a lot about that that those principles have guided you your entire life. And um, I think it was a gift too that your dad allowed you to have your own hobbies and things that you wanted to do for fun as well. Yeah, he was, uh, my parents were amazingly supportive of uh, trying to help us find what we love to do and then ensure that we had the opportunity to be successful with it. But one thing they instilled from a very early age was that education was really, really important. Mm. And whether we wanted to eventually work on the farm or do something else, we first had to go get an education. Uh, they just felt like that was game changing in terms of opening the world of possibilities. And then you can choose what you want to do, but first you got to go get an education. So from a very young age, you know, they supported us in what we wanted to do generally, but they were very clear on what they expected. And, and part of that was get a good education. How did they set up that expectation or how did you as a kid recognize so early on that education was going to be that important? Um, I'll tell you a funny story that happened when I was in seventh grade. I came home with my first report card. Um, I could tell my dad as he looked through it, there was something not quite right, you know. <laughs> And he looked down and he said, what's this C? It was A's and B's, by the way, mostly. But there was a C on it. And he said, what's a C? That, yeah, that was history. It was a C. That's average, I told him. And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, I'm not raising average. 
and sort That's of powerful. set this expectation that if I would have tried hard and got a C, that was different. But he knew I hadn't applied myself very well and set the expectation that, no, we, we do our very, very best. That's what's expected. And that sort of changed my understanding of what my potential was, for sure, but also uh, you know, gave me a very clear understanding that education was really important for my parents. And not just to go to school, but you got to do your best and you got to learn and try and apply it. And so, yeah, that's when I knew really clearly what my parents' expectation was. Well, that's great. I've heard you say your favorite quote is, average is the enemy of excellence, Excellent, yeah. right? Is that kind of where that stems from a little bit as well? It's kind of that attitude I think they installed as in, in us, my parents, both my mom and dad. Um, you never fin leave a job half done. You, you finish it. You don't do something just part way. Mm. If you're going to do it, do it. Put it, yourself into it. I would say anything worth doing is worth doing right. right? That's right. <laughs> that was that attitude from a very young age. And I don't know whether they hammered it. They didn't hammer it into us. Mm -hmm. They just expected it. Mm. And we knew that was what was expected. So I, I heard a speaker one time say, you know, I can't imagine that my last words from God before I came down on earth were, now go be very average at your life. And those just, that just struck me. Because like, do you want to be an average whatever new skin distributor or employee do you want to be an average realtor or do you want to be excellent at what you do right and you talked about and we'll kind of jump into your story now but that's kind of how you moved up so quickly in new skin by that principle of doing a little more than what's expected of you right not being average because i think people expect average so when you give them excellence it doesn't take much for people to recognize that in somebody because you started i mean you started new skin over 20 years ago and you started it here where at what position so yeah i started actually as a real quick story i moved down from rick's college because i had gotten my associate degree and i was going to come to byu in the accounting program so my wife and i came down and i had a good friend really close friend from my mission whose name was burke roney you'll probably recognize sure that yeah sure and I got a chance to go visit him in a little uh, building across the street here where New Skin had just started to grow. So it opened in 84. I had come down in 1989. Mm. They were just expanding and trying to hire people to keep up with a uh, business that was starting to take off. And I started that day, not unbeknownst to me, we sort of clocked in and got started right off. And uh, they needed help answering phone calls. And that, that's where I started. I didn't have any idea that at that point in time that, you know, the, the work you were doing that day mm -hmm. would eventually lead to uh, bigger and better things. But I think it's a good lesson to learn that you don't know where, where your work is going to lead you to. So do your very best and make sure you're giving it everything you have. And chances are things will work out good. Well, I think as a CEO, you're probably always have your eyes open to whether it's the kid bag in the groceries or the lady at the bank right or whoever it is people that are happy and excellent at what they're doing opportunities are going to find them because people like yourself who are ceos of you know top companies are always around and, and that you notice these things in individuals and you want them as part of your team we all start somewhere right we <laughs> all have to take that first start and then you hope uh, in my case i had great people that i worked with great mentors who believed somehow in me and then helped me believe in myself so that I'd keep trying to sort of achieve something new. Mm. And I think in terms of reaching your potential, it takes both. You've got to be able to see it and hope for it enough to give it the energy. But man, it's sure helpful if somebody else can sort of see it for you and say, I think you're, I think you're really good at this. I think you got a shot at being really successful. And then it gives you the energy to really go make it happen. But I was fortunate to have people that all along the path gave me opportunity, gave me a chance yeah. to try. Well, it's neat to have that opportunity. And that's part of taking advantage of when a good opportunity came along for you to work at a company that, I mean, you probably never envisioned that it would become what it is globally today. I think you mentioned um, in an interview I listened to of yours where when you got here, it was New Skin International, but they were just in the United States at the time, right? And so it was kind of funny. Uh, you guys are now in what, 50 different About markets? 50 countries, yeah. And you kind of helped with a lot of that as you started growing in the business. You ended up kind of opening up a lot of the European markets. So how did you fall into that role? And give us a little bit of what your life looked like during that time. That's kind of a such a unique opportunity, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was a really a perfect time for growth for me, I think, and for my family in terms of trying to figure out how we were going to 
manage and balance life in a, in a something we hadn't sort of scripted, you know. <laughs> um, I left when I graduated from BYU with my master's degree. I left and worked in public accounting for a couple of years, mm, for about okay. two years, and then I was hired back to New Skin. I was working in our tax department when we were getting ready to open our European operations. And we had looked around to try and hire a finance person. And in the process, just were not finding somebody that seemed to be the right fit or the right price or whatever it was. So um, it was on one of those trips when I was coming back because I had helped work out some somewhat the structure of what we would use from a tax uh, planning standpoint. And it was coming back from one of those trips that our CFO at the time asked if I'd be interested in actually going over. Talked to my wife. We had three little children. Uh, we, you know, felt felt good about it. Felt like it would be a good opportunity for us as a family. That's always what we try and consider first. Secondly, be a great opportunity for a career standpoint, mm-hmm. and learning a lot. And, and so we, we, you know, threw our hat in and had a really good experience. We lived in Holland, but we were traveling a lot during that time. I said I was traveling a lot. Um, but our children were quite mobile at the time. They were five, three, and one when we went over. So they were in, you know, preschool age and kindergarten age when we started. And it was a really, really good experience. I mean, we really just grew together as a family. We started to envision what we wanted to do with our life. Uh, we gained great experience from a career standpoint, which really probably helped me be better because I understood not just what happens here at the headquarters, but what happens out where the work is all happening out in the markets as well. Yeah, I think that's one of the hardest things for people in business is opening those foreign markets. I mean, give us an idea, a couple of the things, because you you probably learned so many different skills at one time being the person over there, but what are a few of the things that are required to open a foreign market that you found yourself doing all of a sudden? Yeah, I was one of four or five people from New Skin working on this project of opening Europe, mm. which was uh, is today 25 markets. And in that period of time when I was there and during the year, the first year we were there, we opened seven countries. Wow. Uh, fortunately, Europe is not as complicated as some other countries in terms of opening, but uh, you definitely have to set up your infrastructure by having banking relationships and legal approvals and corporate structure. And, and you start to hire people and, you know, look for ones that are going to fit your culture and, uh, everybody's brand new. It's not mm. like you're, you have some that are experienced. You're bringing in a whole new group of employees and then you begin to market and present your, uh, products and your business and, um, it, Europe was a challenging, uh, challenging experience for us from a business standpoint. Sure, it was really slow to open compared to the markets we had opened in Asia, which sort of took right off. Mm. So, I'd say you know most of my learning didn't come the easy way. <laughs> yeah, it was like okay, wait, Plan A just didn't pan out. So, how are we going to go to the next phase, and what do we got to do to right size things and uh, so there were hard, you know, wasn't wasn't always easy days. There were a lot of hard days, which helped you really figure out what's important. And uh, yeah, just the immensity of the task seems overwhelming. But you know, I'm sure you guys had a powerful team there working together, and it's a testament to you know. I see that you know, like I said, you're in 50 markets now. Um, you had a chance to open up China as well. Um, but I think because of your family situation at the time decided that wasn't the best move for you. Is that you wanted to just kind of come back to the States or? So we got back from Europe. We did 95 to 97. We were in in Europe. We came back and our our children were starting to grow. But my responsibility from essentially 1999, 2000, 2001 was to help develop international markets. Some in Europe, some in Latin America and Southeast Asia and China. So I flew to China regularly to uh, try and try and develop what sort of a business model would work there and develop mm. confidence with the uh, government authorities that we were meeting with to get support on how we would uh, execute our business model. Once we got the approvals, which was a really big day, uh, approvals to open 100 stores, so licenses to open 100 retail stores. Uh-huh. Then we had to figure out how to staff it. And, and that's a country where you really do need people from the home office to establish the culture and the practices and the processes and the trust that would work. So um, for there, there were a few weeks where we were wondering if it was going to be us that got asked to be over. 
uh, we had an amazing uh, CFO at the time who I really respect. And uh, in the course of those week or two of discussions, he had decided that it would be uh, the right thing for him and his family to mm. go over. So it would have been really tough. Had we actually been <laughs> asked, it would have been a really tough decision because our children were sort of at an age where it was difficult for us to leave. Sure, them. want to have a little bit more of their own culture here. We were here starting in the States, to really establish you know, what their talents were and th mm -hmm. things that we felt would be hard to pull translate them out. over, yeah, pull them out. Gotcha. Well, is that, so when he, when the CFO left, is that when you stepped into the CFO role? That's right. That's what opened the CFO role up. Oh, and then you did that for the next, what, 15 years? Yeah, close to 15 years. Okay. So being CEO versus CFO, is the management style different or what changes have you had to make as a leader going from, I mean, they're side-by-side -side offices, right, in every company. They're working together every day. But what did you have to do or what new challenges came to you as a leader going from CFO to the CEO? Yeah, it's uh, I should have been CEO first because I would have been a better CFO, <laughs> probably. But at the end of the day, it's a very different mindset. Uh, for me, at least it was. Uh, really shifting from protecting the balance sheet and making sure the margins look good and you're building... Uh, you know, a strong financial infrastructure. While that's still important, it's not my focus today. It's really about how do we grow? How do we take care of our employees? How do we establish something that's going to continue to grow for years mm -hmm. into the future? And so it's been a fun change. I, I've really enjoyed it, but uh, mostly because I've got a really good team around me that uh, make, make the job so it's not that difficult. It's uh, certainly a, a joy to do it together. When you're looking to build your team, I think that's one of the things that separates companies that take off like new skin has and stay sustainable like you guys have versus ones that kind of die out a little bit but what do you look for in individuals that you're looking to bring on that executive team uh first and foremost is always culture mm. you know we can we can find skills but do they have a culture that fits what we're trying to accomplish we have a mission at new skin to be a force for good in the world and empower people to improve lives and if and, and there's a lot of good people in the world, but they don't all necessarily fit that culture. Can they be happy and thrive in a place where we, we, we need dollars at the bottom line? We have to be successful or it's hard to carry out your mission of mm -hmm. doing good. But do they really get the fact that there's more to life than, than trying to produce profit at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. So culture is first and foremost. And then secondly, mm -hmm. I think I try and find people who don't have the same skill sets I have. I think that's a key, right? That a lot of leaders make that mistake their first time and then they realize they like somebody because they're like them, but they realize the very things they're weak in, they yeah. need somebody else that's strong in. That might be the toughest thing actually is realizing where you're not good. Mm. And uh, for me, there's a lot of those areas. So it's it's easy to go find people that have skills that, frankly, I look at myself and say, you know, that's not, I'm not super good at that. So let's make sure we get us when I hired a CFO, uh, I had been the CFO for a long time, but it would be really nice to have somebody with a different strength and skill set than what I have and mm. really fortunate to find somebody who fits like a glove in terms of culture and in terms of, you know, the, the trust that I have with him. But at the same time, he's, he's really different in terms of how he carries out the responsibility versus how I would carry it out. Mm. So when you had the opportunity to become CEO, the CEO got called on a mission and you knew the board was going to be looking for somebody new. Were you surprised or how did you find out that you were going to be the new CEO? And was that a tough decision to take the job? It was really tough. Um, it, it sounds funny. I'd been C CFO. I sat in that office right there. <laughs> I mean, all of 10 feet from here. <laughs> and for 14 and a half years, did that responsibility and worked really closely with Truman Hunt, who was our CEO. Mm -hmm. It really did not. It wasn't something I aspired to, certainly. Um, wasn't something I expected to happen. So when he came in and told me that he had a mission call, I think my face went more pale than his, and his was pale. Um, but uh, And I should have known he would get called to be a mission president. He was certainly uh, that type of person. But we had not contemplated, my wife and I, whether this would be part of our future. So we... Um, do you have a code with your spouse? I have a code that's, uh, we need a long walk. That means oh, something <laughs> happened. And she immediately responds back. Is this a good walk or a bad walk? And 
uh, we spent a lot of time talking about whether it was the right thing for us because mm -hmm. we don't do anything individually. But um, she was extremely supportive, and we felt really strongly that it wasn't just by accident that somehow, you know, things had worked out for all these years, and you know, the number of sort of windows that happened to open over time it just wasn't an accident that we got the chance to to be in a leadership position in this company. Uh, it's an honor to yeah. do it. It's, it's a privilege. It's not something I feel, uh, you know, as a burden at all, but it's a privilege to work with the people in this company. I really do feel a responsibility to our sales force, to our mm -hmm. customers, to our employees, to our shareholders. Well, you guys have, I mean, how many employees and how many distributors is new skin currently? We yeah. have around 6,000 employees globally. Um, there's probably close to 2,000 here in the Valley. We have uh, about 1.2 million active customers who purchase every quarter. Okay. And we have about 75,000 active salespeople. Wow. So it's a, it's a big group who, you know, trust us to make good decisions and try our very best to give them future that's yeah. exciting and there's opportunity. You know, you've got to do something that allows them to be excited about what you, what our future looks like. Yeah. It was funny. I was in Japan last year and um, I was in one of the busiest streets in the world. You know, I'm talking about that square. It's known as like the busiest intersection of the world. And there I looked to my left and there's a new skin there store are. and it was kind of cool. I felt a little bit at home, you know, yeah. a little piece of Utah was right there with me. And so I just thought that was kind of a cool little moment, but it is cool how you guys have expanded and really become um, a leader in this industry in the entire world and to be able to manage that and, you know, care for individually you do have that mantle that responsibility as the ceo so i can imagine where most people go of course you'd want to be the ceo i can see why that would be a tougher decision than just yes or no at that moment yeah yeah and i just tell you that fortunately we carry this as a team you know there's a lot of people all around the world who have the same vision and the same understanding of what we're trying to accomplish so that it's it's not uh, nearly i would say as heavy Mm -hmm. as people might think when you have a lot of people helping to carry it. I bet. Well, one of the things that you guys have done over the years, I've noticed at least from an outsider, is you're very innovative. You're always coming up with um, different products and different ways to continue that. Is that a principle that you guys um, are just definitely put a focus on or is that just because of the industry you're in, you're always trying to add product for your salespeople and for your, your I guess, your distributor base? It Really, the credit goes to the founders of the company mm. who started the company on the premise that we would build products with all of the good, none of the bad. What a cliche, right? <laughs> it doesn't sound uh, so innovative, but at the end of the day, it set the strategy that we were going to go build products that we could really be proud of, that were different, mm. that we weren't going to put uh, unnecessarily fillers, uh, you know, fillers that were not... Uh, helpful to the product, we are really going to try and build a really good product. So as we have gone through, uh, there's a number of steps that we've taken to help keep us in, in that sort of area where we can be proud of the products and always have innovation coming. Uh, we've made investments in this area. We purchased companies. We've um, licensed and uh, worked very closely with some of the top scientists around the world. Um, so all those things have come together to allow us to continue to innovate. And I think there's just a really clear understanding in this building that we live and will live tomorrow as long as we continue to be very innovative in our products. So it's a core competency that we built. We have mm. talented people who are focused on that, both in the marketing and our R&D groups. Um, to help us, you know, execute that vision. So for somebody that isn't as familiar with Newskin's products, you know, they maybe think it's still like just a cosmetics company. Give us an idea of one or two of your favorite, because some of the stuff you guys have is pretty amazing. Um, but what are one or two products that Newskin has come out with over the last few years that you personally use or that you're super proud of as a company? Great. So first I should tell you that about, we're named Newskin, so people often do think we're just personal care. Right. But uh, they're about a little, more than a third of our business, about 40% of our business is actually nutrition. Mm. So I would start telling you my favorite products start with nutrition. Uh, a life pack product that we have that I take every day and have taken for 20 years. Uh, continue to keep that product on the cutting edge. There's another product that we call Youth that we launched a few years ago, which uh, really I feel like helps helps my physical body try and perform at its very best. And 
I, th I think that's important that we're I doing everything. I think you're a testament of it. You're in good shape. <laughs> well, I don't know. It, I'm not saying that. I apologize if I came across <laughs> No, no, that no. Way. I just noticed. The, I'm like, the, you're very athletic. You know, the point is when you're running a busy schedule and we don't get as much sleep as we want, we probably don't uh, focus as well as we should on our nutrition. Being able to supplement is really helpful. So those are two really favorite products. Um, we launched a product about a year ago called LumaSpa. This was our latest innovation in kind of the device area. We we love beauty devices and think that we can play a really unique position in that area. So the um, Luma Spa is a cleansing device, cleansing and treatment device that mm. you use on your face and your skin. And um, it just, it, it spans a really nice demographic from my, my daughter who's 15 all the way up to my mom, you know, who's in her 70s. Uh, they all love the product. It's priced well. It makes a difference. Your skin feels really nice when you're done with it. And uh, it, uh, we call it Luma Spa because of the brightness that it gives you. Okay. Luminescent. And uh, we, we love the, you know, the, we love the way people feel when they use our products. And you're better if you look and feel better about yourself. You know, you perform yeah. a little bit better. I, That's I, what we try and do. No, with it's great. Products. I always say, like, it doesn't matter what you look like, whether it's your physical, it's what you feel about what you look yeah, like, right? And so if somebody difference. can feel better about how they're looking, what a great blessing you're giving to them. Yeah. Um, as a company that's innovating all the time, like any company that's innovating that much is going to run into products that you end up having to, to can, and then you got to be disciplined of which ones you go with, which ones not. How do you decide when it's time to pull the plug on a product or when it's time to you know double down or keep pushing? Yeah, I think, again, we have teams that analyze that very well. And we analyze it from a couple of perspectives. Number one, how does it fit with a consumer? Mm -hmm. you know, does a consumer really like it? But secondly, how does that fit with our salespeople? Do they really want to go sell it? Are they pushing if, it? Yeah. If they want to sell it, at the end of the day, and maybe we haven't positioned it quite right or it's not performing like it should, then you double down. Then you go say, <laughs> okay, if at the end of the day our salespeople aren't too excited about it, then let's go build something that they'll be more excited about. And so we really base it off what's the response of our salespeople yeah. who are super talented and they, they know yeah. what's going to work and what's not going to work. And if we follow, if we're pretty plugged in to how they feel, we'll be pretty close on getting it right with our products. Oh, that's great. Well, what are some of the success principles? I've heard you talk about this before, but I thought it was great. Some of the success principles that you teach for your, both your personal, because you, not only do you, are you CEO of, the, you know, $4 billion company, um, you also are a family man and you also are a stake president in your church, um, which is you lead, you know, you kind of help guide over a couple thousand people here in the Valley. And so how do you, what success principles do you you know believe in, or what ones do you profess to kind of help you just be able to handle so much that's on your plate? I think people feel overwhelmed all the time, but you you really excel in so many areas. So I'm just very interested to hear what those success principles are. Well, I'm happy to share um, my my own personal thoughts around this, but. Uh, there's always room for improvement. I promise you that. Sure. And I just got released as the stake president, so I got more time. Oh, know, that's fit everything there you else go. <laughs> in that I want to do. So, um, I, I would start by saying it's really important to have a vision for where you want to go. I think those those that I know and work with that seem to be the most successful, they're really clear mm -hmm. on what they're trying to accomplish and where they're going. Not just a work, but very clear in their family very clear individually on, on what they're trying to do with themselves. And then as a, as a leader in a company, you want to be very clear on where, where you're trying to take the company. So I think it starts with vision. If I can ask a question real quick on that before we get into the other principles, how do you help somebody that maybe doesn't know what their vision is or they're not sure? Like I, I ask people the question, you know, if your life went perfect a year from now, where are you? And a lot of people can't answer that. So how do you help somebody come up with, you know, a, a really great vision for themselves? It probably starts with that question you just asked <laughs> right there. Help them start to think about where do I want to go? And then it'll help me know what decisions I'm trying to make today. Will they get help me get there or not? But mm. um, I feel like, it, you know, I, so I relate it to my own children first. If I can help them see the potential that they have and then develop a desire on where they want to go, they're so much more effective at us not having to stay on them. Will you please practice your piano? Will you please whatever? If they kind of know, I want to go be pretty good at this, 
they're going to be more self-motivated. It yeah. doesn't matter whether it's basketball or school or whatever. So I think you start, whether it's your children or the people you're working with or here at, here at the company, by, by really helping people decide, help, help the individual see what that vision starts to look like. And then it's a game. It's a game changer. That's great. Now I can motivate. Now I can push. I can encourage. I can hold accountable. But man, if I don't know where I'm going, it's hard to hold it. I can get mad at my kids if they're not doing, but if they don't know what they're doing it for, it just really changes. So vision is critical. I'd say I put it right at the top of the list in mm. terms of a success principle is that let's make sure we know where we're trying to go. Mm, that's great. What other success principles after vision do you really strongly try to instill in your employees and your family and things like that? Yeah, then I think it's really hard work and being accountable. You know, it really, uh, if you know where you want to go, you can definitely put in a plan on what, it, what you have to do to get there. Mm -hmm. And then you be accountable for it. If this is where I want to go and this is what I know I need to do. Okay. I'm going to hold myself accountable. How do you do that? You set a goal and you write it down. It's not, it's the same things your mom and dad tell you. I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to tell you anything really new, but you got to hold yourself accountable and really mm -hmm. work at it. Um, I, I find that, I'm a lot more productive if I'm up early in the day. And yeah, you sacrifice something. Something has to be sacrificed in order to be successful. So you got to decide what that's going to be. And in my, in my life, I don't want it to be my personal health. I don't want it to be my spirituality. And I don't want it to be my family. Sure. So, okay, somehow you got to fit <laughs> those things at the top, you know, priority. And then somehow everything else will kind of take care of itself. Mm -hmm. So the best way I can do that without taken away from family and everything else is to get up really early what time do you get up uh, usually 5 to 5 30 okay yeah it's early so it used to be earlier the older i get the harder it is to roll out of bed but <laughs> I, I get up early and then i've got i know i've got an hour to an hour and a half that's my time mm. to really focus on what i need to do to be physically uh, where i need to be and to be spiritually where i need to be and i can also do a little of work Mm -hmm. where there's no interruption so really effective at you know having a clear mind and i do that and then by the time my kids are up it's not your day anymore you just your day is gone that was done and now it's somebody else's day and you can focus your time and energy on everything else that needs to happen i think that's a great time management secret i i feel like when i get up you know at five that that hour is like key that first hour hour and a half because there's not much going on in the world in general it just feels like the world's a little bit more in tune to what you're trying to figure out, right? You're a little more clear on everything and it just really helps you to, um, get that spiritual and that, um, you know, that physicalness to your day that really gets you motivated for the rest of the day. Yeah. You feel better. It, it sort of sets the pace. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to run a marathon or whatever, you follow the guy who's setting the pace. That's right. But you usually only need to follow him for a while and then you sort of find that pace and you keep going. Uh, if you can start your day at a pretty good pace, you'll probably be able to keep that momentum going throughout the day. No, oh, I think that's that's great. Well, so for you, growing up on the farm probably helped instill a lot of this work ethic, the ability to get up early and start a day productive. Um, has it been difficult for you? Is there some of those principles you wish you could instill in your kids? Or how do you replicate the experience not growing up on a farm, I guess? Yeah. And I don't think everybody has to do it exactly the same. I sure. even see with my kids, some of them, you know, are going to be, uh, it's easier for them to get out of bed early and some of them it's a little bit harder. They can all be successful. But the point is they got to prioritize to to the point where they take care of themselves physically and they take care of themselves spiritually. Because if not, the rest of your life eventually is going to crumble in my view a little bit. It's going to be tough. Yeah. It's going to be really tough. Uh, it'll be your health or it'll be something, you know, things are going to crack that uh, you got to do your very best to ensure you give yourself a chance in all those areas. So um, I don't know that everybody has to get up early as I look and think about my kids, but they need to be productive and utilize their time really wisely. And if, uh, and fortunately, most of them get up early and they take care of it in the morning. But um I've seen others who are very successful doing it other other ways as well, but mm -hmm. you've got to prioritize and, and ensure somehow you block out a portion of your day where you're not going to be interrupted and you can take care of the things that are important. Yeah, I always say to people, it feels like people that get overwhelmed have forgotten to take care of themselves. And so whatever 
I say, you know, whatever you have to take off your schedule or whatever you have to take off of your ledger right now so that you can put that sharpening the saw time in. That's one of the most crucial pieces that you've got to have every single day. Such a critical principle. I would just add to, I have an amazing wife. Mm. She is so good at helping me keep balance. How did you find your wife? I think I have a lot of single listeners. I'm a single guy. And so we're always, you know, I interview a lot of um, experts in those areas of um, dating and um, relationship. And, and that's one thing that your employees have told me about you is you do have an excellent marriage, family life. So how did you go about finding your wife? Um, I'll ask that first and then have a few follow-up questions. Yeah. We met, uh, she was the sister of a really good friend that I met my first year in college. Mm. And, uh, you know, we, we ended up meeting through that a couple of years later, actually, after I'd come home from my mission. And it was like I had just met for the first time my very best friend. Mm. And by the way, she was super cute. You know, I mean, <laughs> how does that work out? Your best friend and she's really cute. And uh, we fell in love and, and got married. And um, from, from the beginning, there was something that she did that brought the very best out in me. Hmm. And I think that's all, that's a good thing when you're looking to find somebody that uh, is going to be a, a great companion, a perfect companion for you. Perfect. There's no such thing, but a really great companion is somebody who makes you so want to be so much better than you are. And somehow together you put one plus one and three or four, you know, it just sort of, you, you rise to a level yeah. together and uh, she's really good at helping me keep balance. Mm. she's really encouraging to me to be successful in everything I do. If I'm going to a church calling, she'll say, you know, this is really important tonight. Mm. You have my full support. And all of a sudden you feel empowered to go do it. If I'm coming to work, it's the same thing. You know, go, go do your very best. Um, but at the same time, there, she'll say, hey, I really believe your daughter needs you tonight mm -hmm. or you know can can we spend time together here or there so she has a real good sense on when maybe something's getting just a little out of balance and together we work at it and she's really good she's perfect for me no well what a blessing to have somebody to help you find that balance which is one of the hardest things i think everybody's always looking at how do i find that balance in my life right um, do you guys have any specific rituals or habits or things that you do that has helped you keep um, your relationship where it is through through the years? There are certain things we have felt that are non-negotiable in terms of uh, life in general. Obviously, we're, our, our life is built off faith mm -hmm. in a God in heaven who we, we really trust. There are certain things that allow us to be close together as a family. And one of those is family prayer. Mm. And it doesn't matter if I'm in Japan or China or what time zone it is, we do not miss family prayer. Mm. And the it's sort of things like that that we've determined through, uh, you, you know, in our marriage that are going to be non-negotiable. It doesn't matter whether we're traveling. It doesn't matter what the excuse might be. We are going to stick to certain principles that we feel like will really build our family strong. And uh, that, that's one of them. Spending individual time together is just really, really important. Our best time, it sounds really simple, but is going on walks at night. And sometimes even when it's late, we finally get home, we get the kids settled. Um, if we can go on a 20 or 30 minute walk together, we have all that time to sort of catch up and mm. make, make sure we're you know on the same page and connected. And it's... Well, as the world gets busier and busier, what a powerful thing to leave your phones i'm sure and just go on that walk and just have that time where you're fully present with each other that's right that's right that's exactly what it is that's great well at the end of the day you lay your head down and you know you've had a successful day what what has to happen in a day for you to just know today was a very successful day you know sometimes maybe the most successful days are the hardest ones mm -hmm. and you lay down exhausted and <laughs> you sort of scratch your head saying wow did we really did we really succeed today or not? But then you come to find out that, that that turned out to be a really important day in the progress that you're trying to make. But successful day is one where you feel peace at what you're doing, and whether it's hard or easy, you feel like you're doing it the right way. A uh, successful day is where you know you, you did your very best, you gave it your best effort. Maybe you didn't win, but you gave it your very best effort. And a uh, successful day is when I know that the most important things in my life were taken care of hmm. and you, you can sleep really sound 
successful day is when you're honest and when you're, you know, you're, you're true to all the beliefs that you really believe. Okay, you can sleep good, you know. Yeah, you might have had a rough day, but at the end of the day, you sleep really sound. So. I think that I think that's great. Integrity is the word I think Integrity, of. I'm yes. listening to you here. Well, last question I guess I'd give is um, somebody that's listening to this and maybe they've you know you've you've followed this from just being in college all the way through. I mean you through the internet era as everything's changed so much has changed in the even the last twenty years. Um, what advice would you give to a young person at this point that's maybe thinking, you know, they're seeing Rich Wood and they're like, man, I would love to be the CEO of a big company one day. What would you tell them to be doing now when they're in college or their first job to kind of prepare themselves to one day be in shoes like yours? I would say if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> if, I, if I can grow up in a little tiny farm, or a little tiny city with a really humble family, anybody has a chance to do it. So first of all, go for it. Don't, don't, you know, go big. Don't aim low. That's the worst thing we can do is aim too low. Let's aim high and see what we can do. And then I'd tell them to get a vision. Start by creating a vision on what you want, what you want from a family standpoint, what you want from a personal standpoint, financial standpoint, create a vision mm. and then start working towards it. I think that that's excellent advice to end on. So thank you so much, Rich. This was thank a true you. pleasure and uh, thank you very look much. forward. Thank you so much. Good luck, Kat. Thanks.